My name is Maria. I'm a PhD student at Bergen University. Here I became increasingly interested in microorganisms and their role in nature. They're so small we don't see them, but they're extremely important for everything that happens in nature. I think marine microbes are very fascinating. When you see images from advanced microscopes, you can see they look amazing and diverse. There's a whole little world there that we don't understand. And it's a world that has a great impact on the global climate. Defining what a microbe is is both fairly simple and extremely complex. To put it simple, it's the little organisms that we can't see with our own eyes. It's complex because there are so many different kinds of microbes. Microalgae, bacteria, protists and viruses. You can coarsely divide the microbes into two main groups. The ones that consume CO2 and produce carbon and oxygen, and the ones that consume carbon and oxygen and produce CO2. Microalgae are microscopic plants that use CO2, water and sunlight to produce carbon with oxygen as a byproduct. Bacteria is the most abundant group of microbes. They eat dissolved organic carbon floating around in the ocean and produce CO2 in this process. Protists are small, single-celled animals that prey on phytoplankton and bacteria. And then we have the viruses, which infect both microalgae, bacteria and protists. Since there are so extremely many of them, like 10 million in one milliliter of seawater, viruses must have a big influence on the whole microbial community. The aim of uh, Micropolar is to study the marine microbes in the Arctic. So here we have a nice old map of the Arctic Ocean with Greenland and Svalbard and Northern Norway, which is where Micropolar is focused. Um, we have warm water streaming into the Arctic Ocean this way. It goes all around the Arctic Ocean and comes back out, carrying a lot of icebergs and being really cold and goes down the east coast of Greenland. Micropolar focuses on the water masses that stream into the Arctic Ocean, north of Svalbard, and on the water that returns down the east coast of Greenland. We have cruises in the deep water here, and we have studied a fjord in East Greenland here. My role within this project is to understand how the microorganisms in the Arctic Ocean are behaving under different conditions. Um, so we study the whole season. The Arctic is, is full of extremes, uh, big contrast, the, the summer where it's light 24-7 and the, the dark months in the winter. There are many challenges when doing Arctic fieldwork. First of all, you can't predict the weather. It can be so cold that your equipment can freeze and break. Bad weather and stormy seas can prevent you from getting your samples and you can get seasick. So when you study marine microbes in the Arctic, there's a lot of work to be done even before you're actually out in the field. You have to prepare and pack and make a good plan A, B and C. And then I'm ready to do Arctic field work. We chose to do field work in Greenland because it made sense logistically. A Danish research group was also going there and we could complete each other's studies very well. They focused on the larger animals and we focused on the microbes. By combining these studies, together we could reach a much better understanding of the fjord system. The fjord we were investigating in northeast Greenland is a very low productive fjord dominated by microbial processes. When we arrived, the whole fjord was ice covered and we were thinking, we're not gonna get any sampling done. But we solved the problem by going out with snow scooters and drilling a hole in the ice that we could sample through. One of the most impressive experiences I had in Greenland was when the ice finally broke up. We had been out sampling on the ice the day before, and in the morning there was a lot of wind and within a few hours the ice broke up and blew out of the fjord. It was very warm, 10 degrees, we could walk around in t-shirts, and it was wonderful for three weeks. Then winter storms began. Northeast Greenland is a huge national park. 
full of polar foxes, muskox, seals, walrus, birds, and polar bears. I hope they'll all be there in 10 years as well. Doing Arctic field work on board a research vessel north of Svalbard is quite an experience. The weather, the waves, the isolation far from land, everything is different from what you're used to. You have to set up your equipment and do your scientific work in a lab that's constantly moving due to the waves. It can be quite challenging and stressful. You're also worried that you've forgotten a tiny important part of your filtration system or something. Your nerves are on the outside in the beginning. Here's where I live. Together with Bama. <laughs> Coolest bacterial production and Paul Simon, our best friend. We, don't, we wouldn't do this without him. We couldn't do this without him. When you want to know more about the marine ecosystem in the Arctic, it's central to include the microbes. They might be invisible to the naked eye, but in biomass and importance, they are by far dominating over fish or any other organism. The Arctic Ocean is surrounded by land that contains 50% of the organic carbon on Earth. This huge storage of organic material is mainly stored in permafrost soils. If the permafrost in the Arctic upland should thaw due to climate change, this organic matter will eventually run into the Arctic Ocean. And here it could potentially become available for marine microbes. One thing that I find very interesting and which I also focus on in my PhD project is whether or not the bacteria in the Arctic Ocean are able to eat this organic matter. If the bacteria are able to eat it, they will produce a lot of CO2, which will bubble up into the atmosphere. If the bacteria are not able to use the organic material, the Arctic Ocean can be considered a big carbon sink. I think this question is a very important factor to include in the big climate equation. It's a very intense experience to be isolated for weeks on a ship with so few people. But I would say it turns out really well most of the time. And here's Emily, always busy. The people on board share a common aim to do as much good research as possible while we're there. Everyone knows research cruises are expensive, so we work as hard as we can 24-7. It feels like a race we have to get through, together. Welcome to the Arctic! Oh, snowstorm outside! <laughs> One of the best things when you're on a research cruise is when you return from sea and it all went well. Seeing your samples getting safe on land, ready for transport to the lab, makes you feel extremely happy and relieved. When you've conquered bad weather, seasickness and frozen gear, that moment is the best reward for all your hard efforts. Right then, you don't really care much about the hours, weeks and months with analysis and writing that lies ahead. In fact, my job as a researcher has just started when the cruise ends. Back in the lab, I'll do my best to reveal the secrets of the marine microbes from the Arctic. Hopefully, I'll add an important microbial part of the puzzle named the Arctic Marine Ecosystem. The map of the Arctic will remind me of the experiences I've had during my fieldwork around Greenland and Svalbard. The Arctic is a truly fascinating place to visit. 
It's beautiful. It's pristine. Standing in the midst of big mountains and vast plains of ice and snow, you feel like a very small, very unimportant human being. You're a visitor in an ice-cold world that's both robust and vulnerable. Being a person who really loves the Arctic, I feel extremely sad thinking about how it might change within the next decades. The Arctic is a unique environment. If it's lost, we will never get it back.